Chapter Three of An Anonymous Story by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Three. Every Thursday we had visitors. I ordered a piece of roast beef from the restaurant and telephoned to Elysiev to send us caviar cheese oysters and so on i bought playing cards polya was busy all day getting ready the tea things and the dinner service to tell the truth this spurt of activity came as a pleasant change in our idle life and thursdays were for us the most interesting days only three visitors used to come the most important and perhaps the most interesting was the one called pekarsky a tall lean man of five and forty with a long hooked nose with a big black beard and a bald patch on his head his eyes were large and prominent and his expression was grave and thoughtful like that of a greek philosopher he was on the board of management of some railway and also had some post in a bank he was a consulting lawyer in some important government institution and had business relations with a large number of private persons as a trustee chairman of committees and so on he was of quite a low grade in the service and modestly spoke of himself as a lawyer but he had a vast influence a note or card from him was enough to make a celebrated doctor a director of a railway or a great dignitary see any one without waiting and it was said that through his protection one might obtain even a post of the fourth class and get any sort of unpleasant business hushed up he was looked upon as a very intelligent man but his was a strange peculiar intelligence he was able to multiply two hundred thirteen by three hundred seventy three in his head instantaneously or turn english pounds into german marks without help of pencil or paper he understood finance and railway business thoroughly and the machinery of russian administration had no secrets for him he was a most skilful pleader in civil suits and it was not easy to get the better of him at law but that exceptional intelligence could not grasp many things which are understood even by some stupid people for instance he was absolutely unable to understand why people are depressed why they weep shoot themselves and even kill others why they fret about things that do not affect them personally and why they laugh when they read gogol or shedrin everything abstract everything belonging to the domain of thought and feeling was to him boring and incomprehensible like music to one who has no ear he looked at people simply from the business point of view and divided them into competent and incompetent no other classification existed for him honesty and rectitude were only signs of competence drinking gambling and debauchery were permissible but must not be allowed to interfere with business believing in god was rather stupid but religion ought to be safeguarded as the common people must have some principle to restrain them otherwise they would not work punishment is only necessary as deterrent there was no need to go away for holidays as it was just as nice in town and so on he was a widower and had no children but lived on a large scale as though he had a family and paid thousand roubles a year for his flat the second visitor kukushkin an actual civil councillor though a young man was short and was conspicuous for his extremely unpleasant appearance which was due to the disproportion between his fat puffy body and his lean little face his lips were puckered up suavely and his little trim moustaches looked as though they had been fixed on with glue he was a man with the manners of a lizard he did not walk but as it were crept along with tiny steps squirming and sniggering and when he laughed he showed his teeth he was a clerk on special commissions and did nothing though he received a good salary especially in the summer when special and lucrative jobs were found for him he was a man of personal ambition not only to the marrow of his bones but more fundamentally to the last drop of his blood but even in his ambitions he was petty and did not rely on himself but was building his career on the chance favour flung him by his superiors for the sake of obtaining some foreign decoration or for the sake of having his name mentioned in the newspapers as having been present at some special service in the company of other great personages he was ready to submit to any kind of humiliation to beg to flatter to promise 
he flattered orlov and pekarsky from cowardice because he thought they were powerful he flattered polya and me because we were in the service of a powerful man whenever i took off his fur coat he tittered and asked me stepan are you married and then unseemly vulgarities followed by way of showing me special attention kukushkin flattered orlov's weaknesses humoured his corrupted and blase ways to please him he affected malicious raillery and atheism in his company criticised persons before whom in other places he would slavishly grovel when at supper they talked of love and women he pretended to be a subtle and perverse voluptuary as a rule one may say petersburg rakes are fond of talking of their abnormal tastes some young actual civil councillor is perfectly satisfied with the embraces of his cook or of some unhappy street-walker on the nevsky prospect but to listen to him you would think he was contaminated by all the vices of east and west combined that he was an honorary member of a dozen iniquitous secret societies and was already marked by the police kukushkin lied about himself in an unconscionable way and they did not exactly disbelieve him but paid little heed to his incredible stories the third guest was gruzin the son of a worthy and learned general a man of orlov's age with long hair short-sighted eyes and gold spectacles i remember his long white fingers that looked like a pianist and indeed there was something of a musician of a virtuoso about his whole figure the first violins and orchestras looked just like that he used to cough suffered from migraine and seemed invalidish and delicate probably at home he was dressed and undressed like a baby he had finished at the college of jurisprudence and had at first served in the department of justice then he was transferred to the senate he left that and through patronage had received a post in the department of crown estates and had soon afterwards given that up in my time he was serving in orlov's department he was his head clerk but he said that he should soon exchange into the department of justice again he took his duties and his shifting about from one post to another with exceptional levity and when people talked before him seriously of grades in the service decorations salaries he smiled good-naturedly and repeated prutkoff's aphorism it's only in the government service you learn the truth he had a little wife with a wrinkled face who was very jealous of him and five weedy-looking children he was unfaithful to his wife he was only fond of his children when he saw them and on the whole was rather indifferent to his family and made fun of them he and his family existed on credit borrowing wherever they could at every opportunity even from his superiors in the office and porters in people's houses his was a flabby nature he was so lazy that he did not care what became of himself and drifted along heedless where or why he was going he went where he was taken if he was taken to some low haunt he went if wine was set before him he drank if it were not put before him he abstained if wives were abused in his presence he abused his wife declaring she had ruined his life when wives were praised he praised his and said quite sincerely i am very fond of her poor thing he had no fur coat and always wore a rug which smelt of the nursery when at supper he rolled balls of bread and drank a great deal of red wine absorbed in thought strange to say i used to feel almost certain that there was something in him of which perhaps he had a vague sense though in the bustle and vulgarity of his daily life he had not time to understand and appreciate it he played a little on the piano sometimes he would sit down at the piano play a chord or two and begin singing softly what does the coming day bring to me but at once as though afraid he would get up and walk from the piano the visitors usually arrived about ten o'clock they played cards in orlov's study and polya and i handed them tea it was only on these occasions that i could gauge the full sweetness of a flunkey's life standing for four or five hours at the door watching that no one's glass should be empty changing the ash-trays running to the table to pick up the chalk or a card when it was dropped and above all standing waiting being attentive without venturing to speak to cough to smile is harder i assure you is harder than the hardest of field labour i have stood on watch at sea for four hours at a stretch on stormy winter nights and to my thinking it is an infinitely easier duty they used to play cards till two sometimes till three o'clock at night 
and then stretching they would go into the dining-room to supper or as orlov said for a snack of something at supper there was conversation it usually began by orlov speaking with laughing eyes of some acquaintance of some book he had lately been reading of a new appointment or government scheme kukushkin always ingratiating would fall into his tone and what followed was to me in my mood at that time a revolting exhibition the irony of orlov and his friends knew no bounds and spared no one and nothing if they spoke of religion it was with irony they spoke of philosophy of the significance and object of life irony again if any one began about the peasantry it was with irony there is in petersburg a species of men whose specialty it is to jeer at every aspect of life they cannot even pass by a starving man or a suicide without saying something vulgar but orlov and his friends did not jeer or make jokes they talked ironically they used to say that there was no god and personality was completely lost at death the immortals only existed in the french academy real good did not and could not possibly exist as its existence was conditional upon human perfection which was a logical absurdity russia was a country as poor and dull as persia the intellectual class was hopeless in pekarsky's opinion the overwhelming majority in it were incompetent persons good for nothing the people were drunken lazy thievish and degenerate we had no science our literature was uncouth our commerce rested on swindling no selling without cheating and everything was in that style and everything was a subject for laughter towards the end of supper the wine made them more good-humoured and they passed to more lively conversation they laughed over gruzin's family life over kukushkin's conquest or at pekarsky who had they said in his account book one page headed charity and another physiological necessities they said that no wife was faithful that there was no wife from whom one could not with practice obtain caresses without leaving her drawing-room while her husband was sitting in his study close by that girls in their teens were perverted and knew everything orlov had preserved a letter of a schoolgirl of fourteen on her way home from school she had hooked an officer on the nevsky who had it appears taken her home with him and had only let her go late in the evening and she hastened to write about this to her school friend to share her joy with her they maintained that there was not and never had been such a thing as moral purity and that evidently it was unnecessary mankind had so far done very well without it the harm done by so-called vice was undoubtedly exaggerated vices which are punished by our legal code had not prevented diogenes from being a philosopher and a teacher caesar and cicero were profligates and at the same time great men cato in his old age married a young girl and yet he was regarded as a great ascetic and a pillar of morality at three or four o'clock the party broke up or they went off together out of town or to officers street to the house of a certain varvara osipovna while i retired to my quarters and was kept awake a long while by coughing and headache end of chapter three recording by expatriate in bangor maine